My name is Chris Olander, I'm your co-host, and I'm here with Kirk Lungton, who's also a co-host, and we're here to uh, talk about Strawberry Creek and tell you how we got started in this whole uh, process of walking along Strawberry Creek and displaying the plants that we know about, the plants that we don't know about. So I'd like to uh, start off first of all and tell you how I got involved with it was uh, when I was living in Sacramento in the American River. I spent a lot of time along the American River, which became, which became a metaphor for me and is how the river flows. The river is like life. Life is like a river. And the American River was, was a good name for a metaphor of how we all go. If the American River flows clean and pure, our country is flowing pure and clean. So um, I guess I, I grew up along a small stream which has always been in my mind. And I used to spend, oh, hours and hours along this stream, just uh, walking up down, fishing in it as well. It was actually a slough called Chicken Ranch Slough, which was a sewage for almost all the houses that were along it, all the rural areas. It was out in uh, Northeast Sacramento area. But we would go swimming in it, we'd fish out of it, and fortunately, nothing really happened to us because every year we had a flood and it washed everything out into the uh, American River, uh, which was uh, sad to say, but they started restoring that area. So I got into the whole idea of restoring areas. And when I got out of college, I um, moved up to Nevada County and began working with the South Yuba Citizen League, which was stopping a dam along the South Fork of the Yuba River. A group of people, there was five, who started the whole process. My wife was one of them, and she uh, grabbed me and said, hey, look, we got to save this river because they're going to build a dam on it. How are we going to do that? So I started writing about it, writing poems about it. We started going to political meetings. They were very um, hesitant about even thinking about this as a a wild and scenic river, but with uh, time, probably about five years, we got a huge group of people, and it really happened when the kayakers got involved with it. When the kayakers got involved with it, they uh, had a lot of oh, what, up outstanding citizens in the area, doctors, lawyers, and we started pushing the supervisors, finally got the supervisors to uh, realize that it was a valuable treasure economically for you for um, Nevada County and it didn't really happen until the kayakers got in there and started pushing to get this redone into a wild and scenic river and then uh, it's build momentum and that was a real turning point in all of our lives and the reason why I'm telling you all this is because I just want you to understand that normal citizens, everyday people who have no relationship to a natural area or a river, how much power they have in their community. It actually took us to re-elect new supervisors to get a majority to pass this wild and scenic act. So I'm going to read a couple of poems here that have to do with the uh, river and what I feel about it and how I was pretty much rebirthed by the river. So here we go with a couple of poems. Each day our hands discover the blue emerald river heart, jewel that radiates the canyon's deepest image. The forest fountain bubbling wilderness down the granite crags is building block foundation. Our souls, precious body, a sweet communion for our lips, speaking vast secrets. Fates sing of spirits unfurling leaves from the gold and black oak, nourishing lupin nectar, rippling the spring rivulets, glowing with dawn fire. We dive into its clear pool, spirit laughing, our river current in the mind, deep emerald pools the granite canyon. 
we reflect what is passing through rock, sand, grinds deeper, each year of our lives, memories flowing out of sight. So we look upstream to what is coming, entranced, green serpentine flow, conifer, oak, poison oak, and mock orange, black locust, sweetens the body's electric movement we watch, water bubbling, rolling over cobbles between bedrock, splashing beauty clear, rhythm character polishing gemstone, crystal cascade lace patterns between white bone, the gold of our lives. We climb naked, warm into Marrow's beautiful canyon where this woman gathers her movements true to the course before her in rapid churn, roars the rivers, green, gold, light, pooling her body's treasures, battered by the brute boulders this course to the ocean's generation, spiraling cycles encircling this world body she becomes more beautiful each day, widening my embrace to the essential element. So I'm Kirk Lumpkin, poet, lyricist, performance artist, former farmer's market manager and special events coordinator for the Ecology Center's Berkeley Farmer's Markets. From the early 1950s to the early 1960s, I lived the first 12 years of my life in San Bonancio Canyon, between Salinas and Monterey, California, part of what is sometimes called Steinbeck country, but could also be called Robinson Jeffers country. It was, in some ways, an almost idyllic semi-rural existence, but then, nonetheless, I already had an inkling of an uneasiness about humans and their impact on the natural world. My first watershed was a small creek whose waters eventually drained into the Salinas River and from there into Monterey Bay. I imprinted on the local plants and animals in San Bonancio Canyon, manzanita, coyote brush, coast live oak, buckeye, miner's lettuce, the early spring wildflower shooting stars, black-tailed deer, turkey vultures, western fence lizards, that we call blue belly lizards, and many more. And many of these also live not far from me in my 40 plus years here in the Bay Area, where I currently live in the inland Mendocino County. All of these same species are a part of the local wildlife mix, except for coast live oak, but we have canyon live oak. When Kenneth Rexroth introduced the poets at the gallery in North Beach, where Allen Ginsberg first read his poem, Howl. He somewhat jokingly included in his introduction of Gary Snyder that Gary would soon be founding the Bear Shit on the Trail School of Poetry. I didn't have a name for it when I first attended a Gary Snyder poetry reading in January of 1973, but I knew there was a, a deep schooling there for me. Fast forward to 1996, when Robert Haas was Poet Laureate of the United States and founded this Watershed Environmental Poetry Festival under the influence of Gary Snyder's essay, Coming Into the Watershed. <clears throat> Here are some excerpts from that essay. A watershed is the first and last nation whose boundaries, though subtly shifting, are unarguable. Races of birds, subspecies of trees, and types of hats or rain gear often go by the watershed. For the watersheds, cities and dams are ephemeral. But for we who live in terms of centuries rather than millions of years, we must hold the watershed and its communities together so our children might enjoy the clear water and fresh life of this landscape. The life that comes to flourish within a watershed constitutes the first kind of community. Another fruit of the enlarged sense 
of nature that systems ecology and bioregional thought bioregional thought has given us is the realization that cities and suburbs are all part of the system. Euro-Americans, Asian-Americans, African-Americans can, if they wish, become born again natives of Turtle Island, this continent. In doing so, we might also even eventually win some respect from our Native American predecessors who are still here and still trying to teach us where we are. Watershed consciousness and bioregionalism is not just environmentalism, but a move toward a profound citizenship in both the natural and social worlds. When I first heard about this festival, I knew I wanted to help with it. Also, from that essay coming into the watershed, habitat flows across both private and public land. We must find a way to work with wild systems in a way that respects both the rights of landowners and the rights of bears. And here's a poem of mine from the anthology Bear Shit on the Trail. Essential Poems of Earth First, published last year and edited by Dennis Fritzinger. This poem is about a black bear, but there would have been a time not so long ago before Europeans arrived here, when grizzlies were pulling migrating salmon and steelhead out of this creek to eat. This is called Bear Wilderness Meditation. I know you want that pack and all that's in it safe. Sack of synthetic fibers holding so much of your protection, your sunblock, your gloves, your lip balm, your extra clothes, your flashlight, your notebook with its soulful reflections, half-remembered dreams, and literary pretensions. But maybe you should just let the bear have it. Bear, who is always bare naked, carries all its protection in itself. Great monster Buddha of the wilderness eats so many berries, shits purple, shits orange. Though all bear wants is your food, Bear would gladly rip your baggage apart. Fearing or hating Bear does no good. Hungry mammal like yourself. Have compassion for Bear and all beings. Have compassion for yourself. Your margin of safety is thinner than you think and wide as the starry sky. I'll give you one more very short poem, which is also from Bear Shit on the Trail, Essential Poems of Earth First. It's a haiku. As for building dams, for most, it would be best to leave it to beavers. Hopefully, we're going to inspire you who are watching us and listening to work in your own home watersheds to keep them healthy and diverse so our neighbors, the animals and the plants, will be happy and fruitful lives for the rest of their lives. We're here at the confluence of the North Fork, which is on the other side of the eucalyptus trees over there, and the South Fork, which is right behind me. They're coming together, the confluence, the confluence of watersheds. That's very important. We had a very uh, important time at the turn of the centuries in which all the watershed consciousness was coming together. It was also a, a very um, inspirational time for me when I was going to school. I'm gonna read you a couple of poems here from the watersheds 
that I visited when I was living in Sacramento going to school in the early 1980s, in which I rode my bike from Fair Oaks down into uh, Sacramento State College. And I stopped along the American River there, there was the American River bike trail. And I uh, had several really beautiful experiences. Actually, it was being like almost like being born again. This book here, which is Bear Shoot on the Trail, which has a lot of salmon poems in it. These are salmon poems. And I want to mention this is by Dennis Fitchinger. And this was a very, uh, oh, a, a real good uh, resource for any kind of poetry that has to do with ecologic, eco, ecological experiences as well environmentalism action, getting involved. I really believe in getting involved in your work and in the watersheds. So here we are, Salmon State. From university, I bike east on the American River Bicycle Trail. Leave asphalt for dirt road not traveled before. See what's round San Juan Rapids Bend. Two deep white curls. We rode in summer on the rafts. Ten foot wide dirt road dips in a ravine. River on left, pool of water on the right. Salmon centered in one inch of water over the road. Flops heavy, stuck, flops, splashing. Crystal flowers, rose, ripe, fall, salmon. Five to seven pounds, it's two feet long, shining a flesh scimitar. Fish out of water. I'll eat for a week. Study school tests good on salmon on the native brain food. I stop, watch it flop, flopping weak, unable to propel its weight. My hands guide fishes glide, tail slap dives into the river's opaque jade. Gone into the deep water, disappears, but there's two fish stuck in the pond. The water level is lowering rapidly for the Nimbus Dam water diversion policy. One salmon's generations equals millions lost. Food for thought. The larger salmon, the biggest I've seen since the 50s. Red, black, white, fungus, splotched, sluggish. Slightly smaller fish, dark, silver, red, jaws hooked. I splash in, cold, 10 foot wide pool, two feet deep, a salmon roundup. Splashing, silver rose, flowers, fish, the frenzy. Corralling the biggest fish, I shove it onto the roadbed. The other fish's sense follows the grounding. Heave it onto the road, flopping, shove it into the river, safe. Navigate the slick, ripe female, dripping eggs. Easy, it's 40 pounds, three feet long. Futures, flesh arc, slips from my fingers into the American River, recovering our generation. That was the first sense I got that we really have to start restoring the landscapes we've destroyed, the animals that we have uh, annihilated, the species that we have um, caused to go extinct. When I was teaching in California Poets in the Schools, this was back about 19, 88, uh, Governor Duke Magian, uh, that will give you an idea when this happened. Uh, I was looking for some way of making an awareness about the species that we're losing. So I went to the Fish and Game Department and I got a booklet. 
about animals that are endangered. They had maybe, uh, maybe about 20 animals in there that were on the threatened and endangered list. So I had the kids in a fourth grade, we wrote about animals that were, in, that were uh, under the attack of becoming endangered. And they wrote these poems, and then I had all the kids send these poems to Governor Duke Magian. The next year, they Fish and Game came out with a new booklet on endangered and threatened species, which contained about 200 animals, birds, and fish in this book. That's how you get changes made. You get the kids. I knew my generation wasn't going to do it. We just kind of went back into the hills and decided to live there and enjoy what it was. But it's the next generation, the children. You've got to get the children involved in this. Everybody has to listen to kids because they want their kids to have a good future and have the things that we enjoyed. That was probably one of the most awakening moments I had in which what I could do to get school kids to make a change in the government policies. Now next we're going to have Kirk Lumpkin. He's going to come in here and he's going to tell us a little bit about what his experiences are. Working with and for watersheds doesn't always mean working specifically on creek and river issues. When I was reading earlier from Gary Snyder's essay, I got that from my copy of the Gary Snyder Reader that Gary signed for me saying, for Kirk and his outstanding work. I am pretty sure that the work he was referring to was not so much my literary output, but my work helping to keep this festival going and connecting that to my work for the Berkeley Farmers Markets and the Ecology Center, which as an environmental organization running farmers markets is a very rare thing as it is also a rare thing for an environmental organization these days to still be able to maintain a city recycling contract that hasn't been taken over and dumbed down to a single stream by a garbage company. The real work for healthy watersheds and protecting your bioregion can also be about promoting sustainable agriculture, giving good environmental information and advice, and doing conscious recycling. When Gary Snyder read at the Ecology Center, I got to introduce him, but he had already known about the organization for many years, particularly because one of his sons, as a student here at UC Berkeley, did an internship at the Ecology Center. Of course, working for one's local watershed can also be more direct. Since I retired from the Ecology Center, I've moved to Mendocino County, joined the board of the Willits Environmental Center, and been on the committee, the steering committee for Friends of Outlet Creek. My wife and I live by a seasonal creek that drains into Cherry Creek, that drains into Outlet Creek, that drains into the main stem of the Eel River. Just after we moved there, an asphalt plant was opened right by Outlet Creek, an already sediment impaired waterway that is still home to both salmon and steelhead trout and Pacific lamprey, an eel-like fish that was of great importance to the local Native Americans but is mostly ignored by white folk. There definitely are still Chinook salmon in Outlet Creek, but if there are still coho salmon, they travel farther to spawn than any other coho population in California. Then we and some of our neighbors told the county of Mendocino that it was outrageous for them to issue a permit for an asphalt plant at that location, and if they didn't revoke the permit, we were going to sue them. But in unfortunately typical fashion, the county continued to support business profits over the creek and the quality of human life. 
Finally, after court appearances, hearings before the Air Quality Management District, citizen documentation of violations at the asphalt plant, a public information campaign, we settled with the county and the asphalt company. Though we had to agree not to publicly announce the terms of the settle agreement. In essence, we won. So at least for the moment, the activism of private citizens prevailed in protecting our local watershed. Our lawyer, who I would recommend for other environmental battles, was Rachel Doty of Green Fire Law, based right here in Berkeley. Here's a poem that I will first read the footnote for. A conservative estimate is that there are four to six million species on Earth today. Between the year 2000 and 2050, it is estimated that at least 15% of four million species, which is 0.6 million species, or roughly one every 44 minutes, will become extinct. The high estimate is 50% of six million species, which is three million species, or roughly one every nine minutes, becoming extinct. This poem is called A Wild Faith. Unconscious inside us, we are lonely. Lonely for the animals that lived all around us. They are the world we evolved in. We could not be who we are without them. From a darkness deeper than memory, an undertow pulls us into an ache, a nameless place where we mourn the species we've lost and are losing. Trying to kill fear, we killed all the predators big enough to kill us. And our ever increasingly powerful technology, snowballing population, and consumer culture have accelerated the killing and turning of a world of living into a world of made. With more homeless humans, more homeless animals, and less of anything wild. But I have a wild faith that life will keep evolving, becoming more godlike, despite the human race's hell-bent drive toward self-destruction. But whatever our fate, it is such a great sadness that we doom to extinction. So many fellow creatures, some so small or secretive, we will never even know what was lost. Our cars and houses are like space capsules filled with TV and traffic noise covering the cries of our fellow creatures, reflections of our natural selves, burning in the internal combustion of the global economy pushing climate change into hyperdrive, everything choking on oily smoke, cascading extinctions, Earth becoming a sun-seared toxic wasteland where only bacteria, a few plants and insects can survive. Yet a silent scream is vibrating up our spines, shaking every thread in the fabric of our beings. And it doesn't have to end like this or worse. So uh, after I got out of uh, college and moved up to uh, Nevada County, I started uh, working on the landscape, taking care of our landscape. We have uh, five acres in which I wanted to make it a native landscape as much as possible. I know we've lost all these things, but I have, we have animals there uh, we have squirrels, we have uh, actually bears go through there, we have mountain lions that go through, we have coyotes that visit our pond. Uh, that Our pond is a real resource for the animals in that area as they travel from Deer Creek up over the ridge on the north side of Deer Creek 
and then travel through a BLM pro, uh, parcel down into the Yuba River Canyon. Uh, one day, uh, uh, somehow, I've tried to retain a sense of intuitiveness to the landscape around me. And one day, it was calling to me to walk down the hill. We live on a slope, probably about a 45 degree slope. And I walked down the slope, and this is the experience I had while walking down the, the slope. Um, the first uh, part of this is a quote out of the Bible in which uh, we really need to evolve ourselves into a new spiritualism if we're going to survive on this planet. And the first part reads like this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his head. Genesis 3:15. Becoming aware of it, sitting at the window, looking out over the oak pine forest, something below draws me from this house. A feeling I am learning, trust instinct on this land. A breath of air rising ravine slope guides me down trail in a hot August morning. Red, raw, clay rock slope, blue, black, live oak, light shadow, steps, crackle, slough, layers, centuries. Thighs swish the tall grass, scattering the exotics further. I step between trunks of an old live oak in woodland chaparral. Odd angle spirals out from under boot sole shadow. Silk scaled braid coils patterned question. Knowledge. Eyes tunnel source. Integrity licks air. Intense heat flicks fear rattle. Heart head poised our eyes fix. I back up the boot soil. Soul. A blue-bellied lizard still on trail. I am curious. Twig tease backs the snake up left in leaves and dry grass three feet from the lizard. I poke the lizard's life. Test convulses nerves, propels its body, quivers slithering down the one-foot slope drop. Ah, snake's eyes. Fix it. Lizard arcs left through leaves and dry grass, slither quivering back up one foot slope rise, last twitch stops. Three inches from the rattler's flicking tongue fork. Eyes fixed, returning to its land's law in the body's purest work. We hold that power withholding the heels bruise out of harm's way, learn each other's needs. Respect all moving over this land since the beginning, when we first set foot on this sacred soil. So one of the things I learned after getting out of college and working with the landscape is that uh, the pathetic fallacy doesn't hold. Uh, since about the 19, uh, up to about the 1990s, uh, academics was really concerned with, oh, the pathetic fallacy. Animals don't think. Animals can't feel. Plants don't think. Plants don't feel. We've had that consciousness in our mind probably ever since the Renaissance time, that they are just things out there that we can deal with however we want to. But in the last few years, the last about 20 years, we've had so much scientific information that tells us that, yes, plants think, they work with each other, they move with each other. Animals think they have their own conversations, they have their own cultures in which they live, animals and plants. We really need to learn to respect that. And also, as I said earlier, educate the younger generation because that's how we're gonna make a change. That's the only way we're gonna make a change. And one of the things that I found was very uh, informative is that each watershed, every canyon, every little stream has 
a species such as a, uh, a squir ground squirrel, but each one of those species has its own sense of DNA mixed up within it that causes it to be a little bit different, even though they're the same species, they're a little bit different, just like human beings. We're all animals. We've got to learn that we're all animals and we have animal consciousness. If we don't, and we don't use our intellect, we're in for big trouble. But one of the beautiful things that happened to me, because I do native plants, and I have these uh, two, and I'm not really good at Latin names, but one of them is the uh, star tulips, and the other one is the globe lilies. Those things grow all over in California on the, on the, uh, on the west the slope of the foothills and also on the uh, coast range. But they change. It's all evolution, and they change. So here's a, 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 a new plant that I found on our property, which you name it, April weeding, alien, exotic, or noxious plants from this native garden under old manzanitas trees, snow bent, earth root branches, upturned red limb flames, pale green smoke flowering pink bells, but light yellow petals fluttering under manzanita leaves, catch my fancy, similar to Calicortus superbus, Mariposa tulip, foliage like Calicortus albus globe lily. Three flowers fan equal length stems, round, perhaps pedicels, four inches merging to one stem, perhaps umbral, lacking joint nodule, no leaf or stipule, entire stem, stout, round stem like globe lily, but shorter, 10 inch stem overall, between globe lily and Calicortus monophyllus, star tulip. Stem slightly bowed, heavy, not like star tulips, limp stem, and unlike globe lilies, single broad leaf from stem to base. Three leaves spew from this stem base, leaves broad and long like globe lily, rather than star tulips, short, thin, linear leafed, single stem. Three flowers bell-like, with three wide, pale green sepals, similar to star tulips, but shorter than petals by half, not thin or long as globe lily sepals, three petals to each flower, mariposa tulip shape, petite lip, rounding like star tulip tip, curving mariposa's lip pout sassy, Unlike globe lilies, drooped pointing petal tips with nudish white hairs into rose purple arc, delta's base union with ovary. Or star tulips, loose hairy petals, swelling anthers and pistol cleft. These three flowers' petals subtle, poised, trumpet, elegant, gracing nine butter yellow muses, golden light hair mid petal into curves maple moist spot, divine eye, rarer than star tulips gold, more golden than globe lilies chalky white, three flowers laughing April's foolishness, frolicking partial shades, manzanita, blue oak, oracle oak, Star tulips, globe lilies, mariposa tulips, enlightened between branches. Seeds and bulbs rise in crescendo, flowering into its light, rooting this century's native mulch. I call it Calicortus oracle. This is a poem called Salmon Song. Swimming, through ocean, waves, tides, currents, silver scales, 
shimmering, leaving behind in the earth's mind a wake, a bright sensation of delight coursing through its harmonious turbulence, embodying the energy of the simultaneously many-noted singing roar of the wild river they were born in. A song inside them calling them home to procreate and die in the full circle of the salmon cycles, ancient rhythm. Um, here's an excerpt from a poem of mine that is mostly about native tan oak trees, which, at least by timber companies, are often treated like they are invasive plants, like they are weeds, and the timber kill companies kill them with herbicides. This is from a piece called Oak Not Oak, a rap written as though the tan oak tree were speaking. Maybe you felt it for yourself or only seen it in history, how some are persecuted just for who they be. We seem to be most hated for our abilities because we can grow in the shadow of Douglas fir and redwood trees, because we sprout up vigorously after logging fire or injury in multiple trunks prolifically because we're able to survive with our abilities. We're perceived as in the way of making the most money from the logging of the Douglas fir and redwood trees. And the U.S. Forest Service, in collusion with industry, has worked to turn our forests into farms for softwood trees, distorting the ecosystem with what they call forestry. They first declared in the 1940s, matter-of-factly, that we were undesirable, that we were a weed species. But weeds are exotic invasive plants and we are a native tree. No plant evolves as a weed. That doesn't happen naturally. We all evolve in communities, in dynamically balanced ecologies. A plant becomes a weed only, away from its place of nativity. Well, we've stayed in our place continually while destroyed around us our community by the overlogging of the timber companies. So if in some ways we behave as though we are a weed and seem to grow without control, it's because they've killed the quality of our community. And yes, when we are chainsawed down or when we're burned alive, we come back like that martyr, you say, rose from the grave and rolled the rock away. The poison will surely kill us, kill us totally, completely. So that was a little segue into talking some more about invasive plants. Due in parts of the moderate Mediterranean type climate of most of California, there are lots of invasive plants that have been successful here. But native plants are so important because they much more effectively than imported plants feed the native herbivores that are the next step up the food chain. In particular, native insects suffer when they don't have access to native plants that have been displaced by invasive plants. And native insects usually can't eat non-native plants. And it can take thousands of years of evolution for insects to integrate new plants into their diets. And most insects have very specialized diets depending on just a few species. And part of that insect-plant relationship may be that the insects pollinate the plant, making that relationship reciprocal. Though you mostly have heard of the ter terrible impact of pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids on honeybees, Native bees are also being killed. 
and when native insects suffer, then birds suffer. It is particularly astonishing how many caterpillars bird parents need to feed their nestlings. In the rural site where I now live, most of our work restoring native plants has been in removing invasive weeds and giving the natives a chance to come back. While for city dwellers with a yard, restoring native plants tends to be more about planting natives. For those of you living in the East Bay, I would highly recommend Native Here Nursery, a project of the California Native Plant Society. There you can get not just generic California native plants, but plants from a place very close to where you live. Plants from the local gene pool, which is by far the best thing for you to plant. I would also recommend the book Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants by Douglas Tallamy for better understanding the contribution that you can make by planting natives. Also, for inspiration here, there's the annual Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour, where you can see how amazingly beautiful gardens can be that are, that are based on native plants. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I live on about five acres of uh, property up in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada in Nevada County. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is make it a native landscape as much as possible. And one of the, one of the, um, the things that I've really had to learn how to do, and that is to work with fire. Work with fire. They keep, we hear all over, in the, especially in environmental uh, information, about how we have to restore fire on the landscape. And so what I do every year in the wintertime is I cut back uh, dead and dying brush because the wildfire uh, problem is a real problem there. Nobody really wants to maintain their property. They want somebody else to do it. If you don't maintain it, you're going to lose it. And that's one of the essential uh, jobs that you have to do in the uh, wildland fire mix, which is where I live on the uh, west slope. So um, every year I've been doing that. And this year was particularly uh, uh, a lot of work for me because we had this big storm, wet, heavy snow, which broke so all uh, probably about half the trees, which are live oak, black oak, and blue oak. The blue oaks and the live oaks, especially the live oak, because live oak has a tendency to grow out horizontally. And so they don't lose their leaves in the wintertime. They lose some, but not all of them. And so the snow gathers up in there and breaks them. And so I've been doing all this work on, uh, on trying to restore the, uh, the less fire intensity that's going to happen this fall if we don't take care of that whole area, especially up in the, all the way from Auburn, all the way along the western uh, uh, slope there. So this is called winter revisions. <clears throat> Cutting back dead, dying limbs enhances the forms foliage, rewards us twice, image lines, fire cleansed, stack small limbs, branches, abstract for quail, towhees, hawk, snake, lizard, increase insect markets, restore wildlife diversity, shadow dance circles along the fire lines between winter rains, fuel lessons, with smoke, celebrate, full moon rising, solstice storm clouds, consuming stars. Burn grass, scatter ash, chant, nourish oak, manzanita, buckbrush, wildflowers, feed wildlife. Cut up limbs for barbecue coals, salmon, Grilled slow in barter's marinade. Mining niche, telling tales, landscape economics. Renewing oak pine forest. The way earth people work it. Far back, way beyond the historic barns. When stack stone rituals appease. Fire spirits, dry wind rage, 
maintain them flames, tame. So that's one of the, uh, the work I'm doing there. And what I do is I, line, I cut the branches off and I line them up anywhere from about a two foot wide uh, strip to all the way to about four or five feet. I know if you talk to CDF, they're going to get really uptight about this. So we shouldn't really talk about it too much. But yeah, it's basically breaking law. But this is what I believe in with Thoreau. If there's a bad law, you got to break it. That's the way it is. And in the winter time, you don't have to worry about that. Even when it's windy, you don't have to worry because the ground's wet. It's all green grass and there's no problem with really fire escaping. However, I wouldn't advise it for everybody because there's a lot of uh, people out there that don't know their landscape and they will set the place on fire, especially uh, when there's a really high wind. But anyway, that's what I do. And then once, the, once I get the charcoal there, I wait for the rains to wash the charcoal and the ash down. And then I put wild uh, flower seeds out there. Tim Pine, who works here uh, as the uh, uh, restorationist of this area here, he says he puts out grass. But I like the wildflowers because, as, as Kirk was saying earlier, it nourishes the whole landscape. The insects come, the bees come, uh, the insects eat those, the birds eat that, uh, eat the insects and that, and it just restores and also uh, replenishes all the wildlife in the area. That's what we really need to do, is replenish the wildlife on our landscapes. If we don't learn that, we're going to lose everything we have living here on this earth. So I hope you enjoyed this. I really enjoyed uh, being here again. This is my uh, 22nd year. I think the, wild, the uh, watershed actual uh, creek walk has been taking place for just about 25, just about 25 years, 23 or 24 years. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I hope all of you enjoy this. This is the Watershed uh, Strawberry Creek Walk. Uh, I hope you tune in to the Zoom meetings later tonight. I think there's one and also tomorrow, Saturday. Saturday, look up on the uh, Watershed uh, Poetry Flash Watershed uh, schedule and you'll be able to see all your favorite poets and even more. And learn, learn and practice what you learn. One of the things I want to follow up on what Chris was, was saying is, is fire. We must return. Fire must, will, will be, must be in this California landscape. How we do it is the way of the future. We're either going to like burn up through these catastrophic wildfires or we're going to learn how to thin our forests and do prescribed burns because one way or another, the thinning will happen. Anyway, here's a, a poem from my book, In Deep, that I wrote for my wife, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Talkovsky, who used to teach classes in gardening with native plants when we met. And this poem is called Twin Berries for Lynn. It was originally written at Talking Gourds Far Away Ranch near Telluride, Colorado, and then I rewrote it on the occasion of our wedding. Following the arrow body of a dragonfly to a twin berry bush where it grips a leaf edge, its length paralleling the ground. It's brilliant blue and black banded body like a cloisonne pendant or turquoise obsidian beadwork. It points part of my mind back to California, the Marin headlands where just last weekend Lynn identified for me another twin berry bush. How long had it been since I was in love? And even then, why didn't love take root and flower? Maybe I've been a weed out of place and out of control of the wide, wild system. Or maybe I was in my place, but unable to cross pollinate with exotic partners, or maybe I've been like fire dependent species whose certain season has been suppressed. Or maybe 
I'm some weird sub-variety that doesn't fruit until it's 50. In the rooted, wind-dancing, twin berry bush, an image of potentiality. We could be like the seed circling separate but coupled berries, each whole and softly shining, each inside a round full darkness, holding the mystery of our future creativity, poised in the lift of rich red passion petals, growing to the rhythm of all my native longing. Tim Pine, who works for UC Berkeley and who, as Chris said, basically served as a sort of naturalist in residence for many of these watershed creek walks, defines this area as an oak bay woodland before European arrival. The oaks are coast live oaks, along with California bay laurel. My favorite thing about bay trees, who are, which are also called pepperwood, among many other names, is its seeds. Bay trees are related to avocados, and their fruit looks like tiny, olive-sized avocados with a seed inside that looks like a miniature avocado pit. If you roast that pit, the bay nut, you get something that reminds me of a cross between chocolate and coffee, but with a distinctive bayness to the flavor. You can also use its leaves like the Mediterranean Bay, leaves sold for culinary use, only you want to use about a quarter to half as much with California Bay laurel leaves. Bays at this point in time, though not killed by it, have been a major carrier of sudden oak death disease. Another of the important trees here is California buckeye, which besides having the largest seed of any non-tropical plant, have what I'd call a very California-specific survival strategy, in which, unlike most deciduous trees that are winter deciduous, it is instead summer deciduous. This means that they lose their leaves when it is hot and dry and grow their leaves when it's wet. And right now, these buckeyes around here have very new, very fresh leaves which they just were growing out. Um, the next poem I'm gonna do, and the last one, is, uh, it may seem a little dated because when I wrote it in the 90s, since then we seem to have entered a prolonged drought. But I do it in the spirit of our need to adapt to all of nature's powers that are greater than ourselves. From worse droughts to climate chaos, to lo longer wildfire seasons. This poem is also in Bear Shit on the Trail, Essential Poems of Earth First, as well as my book In Deep, and will also be on a forthcoming CD from my poetry music band, The Word Music Continuum. It's called El Nino. Hey, I am El Nino, the bad boy. I'm the weather system that's in your face, on your back, blowing you off and coming down on you. I'm crossing your borders and I don't need no stinking passport. But you can welcome me anyway. Go with my flow. Feel me like a river. Or maybe even throw your head back wide open to me like my lover, La Pacifica, welling up warm to meet me, taking millions of my droplets into your body, feeling each wet little bomb land like a kiss. Yeah, you can ride my wildness. You can ride my wildness. 
for you can let me ruin your parade and drown your dreams because part of it is up to you. And whether you got a house that's built on the rock or you ain't got no home at all, you can't control me. I am El Nino. Ha! I believe poetry and dance are expressions of the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of being. Alive and married to each other aesthetically. Contemporary dancer Sharon Coleman creating lyrical movement to three poems by Alison Hawthorne Deming. Letter to 2050 from her collection, The Excavations, and two poems from her series, Death Valley Sequence in Stairway to Heaven. Now we have Sharon Coleman dancing to Alison Hawthorne Deming. Letter to 2050. The Squamscott River grew lazy in early summer. Muskrat rose and dove. Heron swept the air and landed. And hemlocks that had survived another century's practice of harvesting their bark were thriving. Some suffered beaver girdles and the predation of woolly edelgids. But still, the palliated woodpeckers found what they required in the snags. This is how it was for us, pulling threads of hope out of the air as if we had the skill to weave them back into webs. We surprised ourselves when it worked. So much needed to be undone. And I promise you that as paltry as our efforts may seem to you, no, I won't justify our failures. The story of the alewives' return, that's what I wanted you to know. Because it helps to think of desires that last for centuries without being satisfied. How far inland did the alewives come, I wondered. The dam removed after 300 years, and in the first year then they came in a rush. Locals could hear the gulls gathered in the estuary in their joy, and the alewives swam and swam to the reaches of their ancestors, eleven miles and three hundred years of appetite for place their genes remembered and knew how to find. The Abenaki offered a welcome back ceremony, and fishers gathered, human, cat, and bird, to feast, and the memory that had been thwarted for centuries became a fertile flow. Bear Poppy, Gravel Ghost, Saucer Plant, Napkin Ring Buckwheat, Desert Rue, Fishhook Cactus, Grape Soda Lupin, Parish Larkspur, Desert Trumpet, Beaver Tail Cactus, Bladder Sage, Cheese Bush, Winter Fat, Brittle Bush, Prickle Poppy, Prince's Plume, Devil's Cornfield, Mormon Tea, Rattlesnake Weed, Rock Nettle, Ravens Settling into Salt Cedars. Every name a location on the map of lonely visitors while some tribes who stayed in place gave names that were verbs. Nothing was a thing itself, and everything was busy being itself. No word for desert rue, rather to be the desert rue. So the whole landscape spun with states of being, the land not the land, 
to be bought and quartered, but to be the land, as if made sentient just by being here. Valley of Life, they called the place. Thank you very much for joining us here at the uh, Strawberry Creek Walk for the Watershed Poetry Festival. Uh, this is uh, being filmed along the, along the Strawberry Creek and you can tune in on Saturday and check out the watershed schedule all day long. It would be really great and I really want to thank you all for being here. This has been a real joy for me as I'm sure it has for Kirk. Uh, yeah, my immense pleasure to be a part of this festival once again. Um, we've been doing it for a long time, but it hasn't gotten old. No. It's just gotten uh, a deeper and uh, wetter. <laughs> yeah. Also want to mention that you can pick up the uh, all uh, my books, uh, Chris Olander. I'm Chris Olander, and you can pick up my books as well as Kirk Lumpkin's books on the Watershed Book Market that's on the website. So check us out. I hope you like our poems. Love you, love yourself, love your watershed. Yes, and have a good, intimate relationship with your landscape. It's necessary.